Kia is uh, the system developer, and I'm the, uh, well, linguist. Um, well, yes, and we will say something, or I will say something about how to improve dictionaries by measuring atypical relative word form frequencies. And uh, what I mean by atypical and improving and so on, you will hopefully find out later. Um, the dictionaries that I will uh, present and use in this uh, presentation is Svensk Ordbok Utgivna Svenska Akademin, which is, uh, translates as the Contemporary Dictionary of the Swedish Academy, uh, abbreviated SO. And then we have uh, another dictionary which is called Lexin, which is a learner's dictionary, um, which I don't work with, but which is interesting to compare with when it comes to this, this type of information. Um, so uh, the SO is, uh, as you may notice, not a born digital product. It was digitized in, as an app in 2015, and, and it is online since 2017 on this site, Svenska. Dot se. So svenska means Swedish. Um, so that's the one. As you can see, it has a, quite a traditional uh, dictionary structure. Um, and Lexine is another resource developed at another institution. Um, and as you can see, it was also, it's actually a product dating back to 1984, I think, a print dictionary. Um, so, uh, the first thing is, what's the problem with, with these dictionaries? Then? Well, one of the problems uh, is that um, the frequency information is not explicit. Um, if we uh, look at, for example, the first word here, konstighet, to the left. Uh, it's almost never used in that form in, in Swedish. We use it in the expression uh, inga konstigheter, no oddnesses, if you translate it that way, meaning no problem or something like that. Uh, and here it says, uh, as you can see in red here, uh, Ofta plur, meaning often plural. So that's one kind of information about morphology, but it may not be enough. One can discuss that. Another example is the adjective sun, uh, which is the base form in a sense, uh, but it's much more frequent in its t form, uh, with the suffix t. Um, because this adjective is not like adjectives like yellow or happy or because it modifies a, a clause content so it's like say so it means true and you can say what you say is true it, it sort of modifies a proposition rather than an ordinary nominal uh, <coughs> head and in this case as you can see in the article or at least as I can see, uh, there is no information about when to use the T form and when to use the base form, so to speak. In lexine, uh, this word konstighet is not even included, so that's a problem. Uh, and as for this sant form, if you search for sant, it's possible to search for that form, but there are a few examples with this T form in the base form uh, entry. So we might have some problems when it comes to, to frequent word forms here. So the aims are here to present a method for uh, examining uh, word form frequencies by reusing information that we already have. Um, so we have a big morphological database which uh, not even Google can compete with, I think. Um, uh, and uh, we will evaluate the results 
uh, with this, respect to these two dictionaries, and we will focus on nouns and adjectives to begin with. Um, and this is the beginning of the work that I'm presenting here. And we will try to illustrate how, how these frequencies can improve uh, dictionaries, perhaps in general, but Swedish dictionaries to begin with. <clears throat> so ESO is a descriptive general definition di dictionary with the intended user, anyone who wants to know more about the Swedish vocabulary. <laughs> and that's a very <laughs> wide span, I think. It has some frequency kind of like information uh, in the sense that uh, some head, word, head, uh, head words are in, for example, the plural form. So, for example, the plural ostbågar, meaning cheese puffs, is, that's the head word form and not cheese puff. Uh, and also, uh, as you know, modal auxiliaries are often defective when it comes to inflection, and the same goes for this present only form, lär, meaning should in English. If you look them up, you, you, you must use these forms or be referred to them by links. So. Uh, but otherwise, frequency-based information is not used. Um, and the same goes for lexine, I would say. It's a learner's dictionary with the intended user of people learning Swedish. Uh, the only thing that stands out here is that the verbal head words are in the present tense, but that's not due to any frequency. It's, it's because it is assumed that the present tense is easier to, to use as, um, when, when inflecting the verb, at least for, in some paradigms. Uh, word form frequency studies are, I would say, uh, mostly morphological. Um, how to use more uh, corpora, productivity, frequency of roots and affixes, response times, processing of word forms, uh, depending on lemma and affix and so on. Many cognitive studies, um, type, token, productivity, uh, are, is morphology, uh, is that rule-based operations, or do we store words as whole words? Th those kinds of studies. Uh, and that may be useful here, but they conclude all that it seems that frequency, at least, to some extent, is, is important. As for lexicography, it's more... Um, not so much, and I apologize if I have missed very important references here, but it's mostly, uh, if we look in handbooks also, of course, um, it's about selecting and distributing information where do we put the inflected forms, for example? Um, <clears throat> and often you find talks about space restrictions, how to, how to compress um, forms. So, um, but the practical work uh, that we would like it to be carried out is to, if we, for example, just if we just look at an ordinary noun like blumma, meaning flower, uh, that seems to be uh, just an ordinary noun. Uh, but in order, to, in order to, for example, order the senses in the correct way, um, you need to have frequency information about the different word forms of this lemma. So um, in this case, we found that the plural indefinite plural, blommor, flowers, is very frequent, or extremely frequent, compared to, for example, the base form, blomma. And that tells us maybe something about the sense distribution, and I will get back to this. Um, but first of all, we need to find out what is the normal distribution, <laughs> or uh, the most frequent distribution of all distributions of, for example, nouns. And then we use our different paradigms. We have, uh, a rule, we have many rule-based paradigms. I think we have 400 paradigms, <laughs> all in all. Um, but the most common is paradigm number 12. Uh, that doesn't <laughs> tell you very much. But um, looking at this number 12, um, we can, so this is a dominated paradigm then. 
we can identify word forms uh, that uh, ex uh, disturb the expected distribution. And then we have to exclude, of course, uh, homo homography. Take that into account, at least. Um, and then we compare the result with other words, preferably. This is uh, not a very good-looking um, Excel sheet, but it gives, uh, within the blue area there, um, we find uh, this paradigm 12, um, which consists of a part of speech tag, and then the rule uh, operating on the root, and then the number, and then finally the percentage. Uh, and uh, the NCUSNI means noun countable uter singular nominative indefinite. So that's the base form. And that seems to be the most frequent. Uh, and we use this uh, morphological data, uh, we apply that on a corpus. And we can use any corpus, of course, but we've used actually a corpus based on a discussion forum about recent events in society. So that's a, one way of getting new uses. And the second um, most frequent is the singular definite form with 22.5%. And then we have the indefinite plural, and so on. And uh, we can also um, uh, we can also use another way uh, by we can compare. So this uh, database is a relational database, and this is a, a s s screenshot from the my, uh, the SQL or SQL workbench, uh, comparing two. You can compare any two post tags. So in here we compare uh, the indefinite now, uh, singular with the indefinite plural, finding that the most frequent one is false hit. It's, it's actually mostly a verb. Uh, and this isn't lemmatized either. Uh, and the second one is more interesting. It says uh, peng, and peng means coin or note, but the form pengar, which is a plural, indefinite plural, is much more frequent. And as you can see in the rightmost column, it says 12,000 uh, something, and that refers to the percentage. Uh, so dividing, dividing the plural with the singular gives us 12,000 percent. So that's extremely common compared to the base form. And this, of course, gives a signal to the editor to take that into account when, uh, when revising or, or creating a, a new dictionary entry. So the editor interface, is, um, which is created by Monica then, um, here's an example. If, if we were to revise or, or create an entry like sort, or meaning sort, uh, we find, so here you can see in next to the arrow, uh, the different forms uh, of sort. And we find that the base form is not common at all compared to the genitive, uh, uh, nominative, um, no, sorry, genitive um, singular which suggests that something is mysterious here. Um, and when you look in uh, concordances, you find that, or like word sketches, you find that it is included in a very common uh, expression, en such something, a kind of something. And there, such has to have the S form. And that needs to be taken into account when creating this or revising uh, the entry sort. So as you can see in S, S -O, uh, the present uh, version of SO doesn't really take that into account. Another example is the adjective, superlative outliers. A very common form is the superlative 
when it comes to the adjective blek, which means slight or pale. It's extremely often used in the superlative form. But in the SO dictionary, as you can see, it doesn't show you that this is the by far most frequent use. And returning to this blomma or flower again, uh, you find that comparing SO and lexine, um, we see that blomma, the sense order in blomma in SO is first the part of the plant, the colorful part of the plant, and the second sense is the plant itself. And that's probably an etymological ordering of senses. But in the learner's dictionary uh, to the uh, right, you find that the plant is the first sense and the colorful part of the plant is the second sense. And that probably reflects that someone has done some more, or well, has, has taken frequency into account. Uh, because the fact that the, uh, the um, indefinite plural is so frequent is that people buy flowers to each other. And they don't buy only the colorful upper part of the flower plant. They buy complete flowers. And then they use this indefinite uh, plural form. Um, that's what we've found. So that tells us that maybe if we assume that the, the dictionary uh, user goes to the first sense first, then you should have maybe the most frequent uh, usage first. Then. Uh, and this is also an example of how we have implemented um, some frequency here. Uh, previously, in the, or in the present version of uh, ESSO, we don't, if, we, if, if you search for money or pengar in the plural form, you are not referred to the entry peng. So that's, a, so that's one thing that's already happened uh, and which will be visible in the next um, uh, edition of this dictionary online. So that's one practical consequence. And these are some of the references. Thank you. Depends on what you mean. Yeah. So, so you mean the work? Do you mean the interface or? Aha. Uh, uh, no, no. We we uh, no. It's only um, marketed in <laughs> academic environments. If that's what. You mean. So we are, we're writing articles and things, but we 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 are, haven't done anything else. Uh, no, not right now. But we use it for internal purposes. So, so I mean, we—it's just—it's just us in Sweden doing this dictionary work. So we. Is there any difference in uh, how relevant a certain morphological feature is to, as a pointer for a different usage of a word across different types of corpora? Um, no, not yet. <laughs> so we, we've only used one corpora so far. That would, 
we probably find... Dif well, one thing, uh, we, <laughs> that's quite interesting. This, is, this corpus is based on a discussion forum, and anyone can participate there, and people uh, often fight about things. So, um, actually, the definite, uh, the definite singular form of uh, cheft is very common, <laughs> and the Danish people uh, understand what I mean. Um, it means, it's in the expression, hol cheften, shut up. So, so <laughs> And there you, you use the definite form. And that's probably corpus-specific. <laughs> it's interesting that you're looking at frequency, but for me, as a lexicographer, in the end, it's about uh, the type of diction you have and the corpus you base your frequency information on. Uh, I would be very critical as a, if I give numbers from you. I would want to know what is the corpus, how does it relate to my dictionary project, uh, um, and, how does, and, and you have 20 minutes. I understand you can't say anything about that, but could you be more specific about a little bit about the corpus and the type of research? Because, yeah, you draw conclusions which puzzle me. Yeah, the conclusions are corpus specific. Yeah, and uh, so we haven't so we haven't implemented this in, in a, like a large scale yet. So this this is not it's it's on the for fun level <laughs> right now, uh, with some exceptions. But we understand that we we need to have well some kind of balanced corpora first, of course. To, or, or be specific, uh, specific about what we use as, yes. as, as the base. Yes. Uh, so I, well, I agree. <laughs> but, so, uh. Yes, I'm Jack Ruder from Helsinki, and my question would be, have you applied uh, this to other languages? Because I, I see that maybe the word form frequency could be used for suggesting a possible uh, missing uh, definition for your given lexeme. E. And, and that these might be matched with analogous patterns. Um, yes. Th that's an interesting... So we... Well, to, to answer your question, we haven't tried this on other languages yet. So that's uh, um, what we'll, we'll see. It's, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Hi everyone, my name is Jorge Reyes Magaña. I'm coming from the National University of Tenomos of Mexico. So uh, let's get started. Here we have all the content that we are going to be talking about. Um, first of all, we have uh, two types of dictionary. The first one is the most common one that is the semasiological that provides meanings. When you have a word, the user obtains the meaning of such word. And the other one is the onomasiological, when that works in the opposite way. Given the description of a word, the user obtains the related concept. So I try to do an electronic onomasiological dictionary, a kind of that, a reverse dictionary that are based on some word association norms that I'm going to be talking about this kind of um, resources. So nowadays we can think that the mosiological search is made through different electronic ways, for example, Google, Yahoo, or other searchers, when you can put your uh, definition of what you're trying to look at, and all the uh, word that you're trying to, to look is going to appear here, but in sometimes this word is not good enough, and it gives more information than what you're looking at, so there is no uh, good sometimes. So in this layer, I'm going to present the main idea of my work. First of all, I'm going to have some definition made by humans. For example, a person uh, say, what is a small rodent living in trees with a long bushy tail? So with this definition and this description, I only kept some specific words in a lemma way. For example, I have only um, broad and leaf, tail, bushy, three small. And with these words, I have um, applied an algorithm into a graph. This graph, it's a mathematical object that has some properties. So uh, you can run algorithms into this graph and using the words that the people say to me, I have to infer that what the person is talking about is a squirrel, for example. So um, this is the, the basic idea of my work. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the word association norms. These are some psychological uh, resources, psycholinguistical resources. When, and this work, in first, you, they give you a word, for example, B, and you have to say the first word that comes to your mind when you hear B when somebody says B. And in the first column, we have different words that represent the response that the people give. For example, hive, honey, sting, boss, wasp, etc. Of all of these words were made by people when they hear B, when they hear B. So uh, the first one, the, the word B, is the stimulus word, and the other ones are called the response words. In the second column, sorry, in the second column, we have um, mathematical values that represent the frequency, and in other way, it represents um, the associative strength that is only a percentage that is calculated from the frequency. So with these uh, two values, mathematical values, I construct a graph. The word association norms are the nodes, the words are the nodes of my graph, and for example, in this layer, we have the word B in the center that represents the stimulus word, and all the responses are around. Um, it seems to be some edges that connect each one of the words that are present in the notes, and you can put the value into that edge. That is called a weighted graph, okay? And there is another example here that is of water. Water is in the center, and all the other words were the responses that people give to water. Uh, I only present two of these stimulus words with these responses uh, because all of the graph that I used is too big to present in one single layer. So this is the main idea of the original resource that I used to run my algorithms. So. I use two word association norms that are available on internet. 
The first one is the Edinburgh Associative Thesaurus, that it has uh, 8,211 stimulus words with 20,445 different words, including stimuli and responses. The other one is the collection of the University of South Florida, that it has more than 6,000 participants that produced nearly three quarters of a million responses to 5,018 stimulus words. I use in a separate way. It means that I have one graph for EIT and another graph for um, Florida collection. So, uh, the, a general idea of the graph, uh, the graph representing the word association norms has been elaborated with lemmas. I use only lemmas of each one of the words. is undirected, so that every stimulus is connected to every associated word without any precedence order. And for the weight of the H's, I have two functions, the frequency and the association strength. Um, this algorithm that I use works on shortest paths. So I have to make an inversion of that frequency and an inversion of the associative strength. First of all, when I um, finish my graph, I, it's time to produce or to run the between century algorithm that it makes the search. So this algorithm is a uh, math thing, and it was developed in 1977. And the main idea of this algorithm is that the traditional between this algorithm assumes an important node connect to other nodes. So um, this is the formula that calculates this between the centrality from one node. It's some mathematical stuff, and it says that for a given node V in a graph G, the between the centrality is calculated uh, as a relation between the number of shortest paths between nodes A and J that pass through node V and the number of shortest paths between nodes I and J. So um, in this next layer, I give you a little uh, explanation of how this is calculated. This is a little, uh, a very small graph that only contains four nodes. And we are trying to calculate, in this case, the between centrality of node V. So uh, let's see. We have to look of every path in the graph. For example, if we look the path that are from A to B, it's only one path. And how many of those paths pass through B? Only one, because it's in the other side. So when we calculate the value is one divided into one divided into one. Um, everything is almost the same, but in the next, in the last uh, element that we have into the right, we see that we have a zero because we are calculating there the path between C and D. We have only one path between C and D, but no, no one, none of those paths pass through B. Remember that we are calculating the between centrality of node B. Okay, um, some math that I have to, a little brief explanation, because I use these things to run my algorithm. Instead of having nodes like A, B, C, or D, I have words, remember that. A little variation of this algorithm, the between centrality uh, was made and instead of having the shortest paths in all the graph, they use only one subset that works like the um, origin and one other subset that works like uh, the destination of the shortest path or the target. And the between centrality are the nodes that are in the middle of those uh, subsets. So for example, uh, it's a general idea of how the algorithm works, but my subset is going to be the, the words that I present in the first layers, rodent, bushy, animal, etc. And th this same subset is going to be the target one. So it is supposed or it is expected that the between centrality nodes in the middle of those is the word squirrel. That's how my work 
is done. Another um, algorithm that I tried is called PageRank. That is the one used originally by Google. And that was used to rank the, the pages that we have in internet, which one is the most important, uh, taking into account all the incoming links that has into a uh, graph. So, for example, we have this graph, and node B has a, a highest value because it has a lot of incoming links. Instead of having web pages, they have words. Um, the hypothesis driven here is that the target word tested with a definition to be searched correspond to the higher scores returned by the page run algorithm. This is a, a briefly pseudo code that represents the algorithm complete. We have, first of all, to pre process all the one data sets, having only the lemmas. We have to pre process the definition to search. Yeah, in the same way, we kept only the lemmas and we removed the stop words. Uh, then we build the graph with the word association norms. Second, I have to prune the graph because in a very big graph, all the paths were going wrong and we are not getting the correct words. So I have to cut some nodes into the node that give me a more reduced graph and this graph work uh, in a better way. And for each definition, uh, I only uh, kept the words that were available in the word association norms. I built the subgraph that was used like source and target, and I run the algorithm, the between centrality and the page rank that you can see in the last uh, part of this pseudo code. That is only the, the call to the methods, the mathematical methods. So, well, I had an uh, evaluation corpus uh, consisting of seven concepts. Ten definitions were proved of each one of those concepts. They were given by human native speakers. In most cases, the, defi the definition are very different from the ones found in dictionaries. They lack specialized terms and include cultural references and connotation. And the words that were, that were tested were water, squirrel, bench, hurricane, lemon, bucket, and clothes. Here is a brief example of how the definition, uh, what were the definitions that were, were tested in my program. These are the definition of squirrel. And to give you an idea, how were the definitions that were used. For my evaluation also, I use a metric that is called precision at K. That uh, precision at one stands that the concept associated to a definition was ranked in the first place. Precision at, tres, at three, sorry. Uh, the concept was in the first three results. Precision and the same applies to precision at five or precision at 10. That what I was looking for was into that range. My results are the following. And remember that I didn't combine the two word association norms. I work it separately. I have the EAT results in the upper part. Uh, I have two uh, weight of the graph. The first one is the inverse frequency and the inverse association strand applied to the two algorithms. Remember that I work with between the centrality and the other one was page rank. In the first case, the, the higher value, the highest value was obtained using between the centrality and the uh, weight of inverse association strength having those value in bold letter. In the next result, we have that is also consistent. I mean, uh, the highest value was uh, using the between centrality algorithm and using also the inverse, inverse association strength. As you can see, the page rank algorithm, uh, it's not good for this kind of task. The, the best that I've tried is the between centrality algorithm, okay? 
Uh, after that, I have to compare myself to other approaches. The first one is the one look to Saurus that allows to describe a concept and returns a list of words and phrases related to that concept. And the other one is an, an algorithm that is called CAPI BM25 that is based on probabilist, probabilistic models with a bag of words implementation. And here are the results that are compared to mine. And in some cases, uh, they uh, won me in precision at three and precision at five, but in precision at 10, I still uh, won uh, by really close. But uh, the most close to me was the BM25 algorithm that showed better performance than a one look reverse dictionary. Uh, the higher results are consistent with the ones seen in the reverse dictionary using the norms of Florida that show the best performance. That's uh, another result that we get, that the Florida are the, the best norms that works for my task. So here we have the conclusions. This paper introduced a model for an onomasiological search that has some novelties. It's really simple and we are using graph techniques and algorithms that run into mathematical things that works um, in a good way here. We observed that the graph uh, that was built with all the nodes and the edges contained in the dataset tends to be not so good due to the number of paths that are common wrong results. And we have shown how the description of concepts that are made by common people with non-scientific specification can retrieve accurate results using our method. And the success of our system with no scientific input can drive new lines of applied search and implementation of different assistant ready systems, especially oriented to people with a range of aphasias like dysnomia and Alzheimer's disease. Here are my references and thank you very much. And you have any question? Yeah, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is, uh, what kind of criteria did you use to prune the graph? What kind of what, sorry? Criteria. Criteria did you use to prune the graph? Oh, okay, the graph. Uh, I kept the neighbors of the definition. For example, a, a small rodent animal, I have the graph. And I can, I can know which are the neighbors of each one of the uh, words. So, for example, I, I don't know, but I only kept those ones. And I work with that small graph. And my hypothesis is that the word that I'm looking for is really near of the others that the people say when they give me the definition. Okay? Thank you. Um, something was, was not very clear to me. You mentioned how you calculated your uh, betweenness centrality algorithm, and I couldn't find the correlation between that algorithm and how you solved it with um, the weakening function. Because in the example that you provided, there were just edges between nodes, and there were no weight attributed to the edges. Um, so I was wondering if um, you can describe how you calculated your between nest centrality algorithm? Uh, I understood about this one. Yeah, uh, no, the next one. That was the page rank, the, uh, mm -hmm. the between nest centrality algorithm. This one? So, yeah, does the, do the edges have any weight? Uh, the weight of one. In this case, we have a weight of one. This layer is only to explain how it is calculated the between centrality of node uh, B in this case. But in my experiment, I don't use the weight of one. I use the weight that was given by the frequency or the inverse association strength. And then the sigma function here relates to? 
uh, the sigma the function, yeah? it, it runs from each one uh, of the pairs of nodes present in this graph. For example, from A to B, B to D, B to C, C to D, A to D, each one of those. And does that represent the weight? That's my question. I'm sorry again? Does the sigma function represent the weight of the... The, sig the all sigma function represent the between the centrality. The sigma function, I, I think you, you are talking about this one. Mm -hmm. All the sigma, all the value of the sum is the between the centrality. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.
Well, um, uh, first of all, I, I have to apologize because my proficiency in English is, not, is far from being <laughs> good. So I'm afraid I'm going to read uh, because when I speak English, I'm very, very slow. And if I read, it will be more efficient. Um, I would also like to apologize for the absence of my colleagues, Maria, Maria Jose Dominguez and Miguel Soya. They have not been able to be here with me today due to different unexpected uh, professional engagements. They told me to send you all uh, their warmest regards. So, uh, the advances in the automatic generation of the natural language have allowed the development of many applications following different methodologies. Thus, it has been possible to generate from weather forecasts to song lyrics. However, text generation has barely been explored to build examples on the basis of lexicographic information. The Multigenera and Multicom projects were launched to explore this issue. They harness the potential of the information contained in balanced dictionaries and take advantage of the opportunities offered by WordNet for lexical data extraction. Today we are, pre we are presenting the different steps taken in, the, in, development, in developing the tools and prototypes within these projects, focused on the automatic generation of known phrases and the sentence, sentence context in Spanish, German and French. Um, the first, the first section of our presentation uh, introduces the core principles of the multigenera and multicom projects. Section two focuses on the main features of the project dictionary, which is the main lexicographic source uh, for both projects. In section three, uh, they combine uh, me theor theoretical and methodological approaches for the automatic generation of linguistic data are explained. This section describes how prototypical lexical units are obtained for filling in argument slots. Furthermore, it's shown the process of lexical expansion uh, phase uh, prior to automatic generation, uh, as well as the role of WordNet ontologies for this purpose. The functionalities and uses of our custom-made tools are also presented in the section. So let's move on to core principles. <laughs> so, uh, Multigenera and Multicom are two multilingual uh, projects. These, the languages involved are Spanish, German, and French. Um, the main goal of the project Multigenera is to develop a tool for automatically uh, generate uh, noun phrases. The Multicom project aims to offer a simulator for creating acceptable sentence context for these noun phrases in the three languages involved. Therefore, both projects are associated in a progression from the phrase level to the sentence level. Uh, the, uh, the development of both projects is fed by different theoretical and methodological approaches from different linguistic theories, such as valency grammar, of course, prototypes theory, meaning to text theory, and, of course, natural language processing. Uh, furthermore, furthermore, our combined method results to the automatic extraction of data from uh, NLP resources, the analysis of corpora, co-occurrence uh, databases and wordnets, as well as the outcoming ev evaluation produced by both generators. In relation to the foregoing, it should be noted that exploring data, or data uh, bootstrapping from NLP resources is interesting for Multigenera and Multicom, and therefore uh, for the resources on which they are based. Resource interoperability is understood uh, here in two uh, directions. The use of data from external resources, for example, WordNet, ontological features, the argument patterns of the Podlex dictionary, and the dictionaries of, uh, from the free link tagger for the development of our, of our prototypes and the use of our tools to improve other resources or to design new ones. Thus, for example, our logical compilations are offered in JSON format so that they can be used directly by other applications. Uh, what can it be useful for? <laughs> uh, we think uh, both projects have many uses, especially for building customized examples, uh, for creating reusable lexical packages, uh, for building lexical extraction tools, of course, and ultimately for studying restrictions within the noun phrase. 
let me talk to you about the Podlex Dictionary, which is the main lexicographic source for, for this project. Um, Podlex is an online valency dictionary of the noun phrase with application in, in, in language production, as other valency dictionaries. It compiles multilingual data in five languages, German, Galician, Spanish, Italian, and French. The main features of this resource, of this dictionary, um, are it's a valency dictionary, it's online and semi-collaborative, it's cross-lingual, and it's modular. Let's now explain a little what these features consist of. Well, uh, Podlex is a valency, a valency dictionary. Podlex uh, provides detailed information on the nominal phrase, uh, on the nominal phrase um, from the point of view of valency grammar. This dictionary concerns primarily the verbal, the verbal nouns, such as evaluation or research, and the adjectival nouns, such as sincerity or tranquility, but also non-derivative nouns, such as problem, for example. Uh, the specific arguments and semantic roles constitute first-order elements in this dictionary microstructure. On the one hand, a series of roles are defined to identify the semantic function of the noun's arguments, for example, that which performs an action, that which is affected, etc., together with their syntactic fun function, subjectivus, objectivus, etc., on the other hand, the semantic description also results to a list of semantic features, animate, institution, object, situation, associated with the valency arguments. These semantic features are present in the different formal realization, realizations of uh, each argument. Porlet is also an online and semi-collaborative dictionary regarding its media uh, features. This dictionary was developed as an online and continuously updated resource based on hypertextualization, user interaction, and combined access. It's not a finished work, uh, as many other dictionaries, I'm afraid, but it's constantly updated thanks to this semi-collaborative nature. You can see on this slide the different levels of collaboration within the Podlex community. Finally, Podlex can also be defined as modular, multilingual, and cross-lingual. The dictionary covers five languages contrasted with each other. Indeed, its database is designed to include more languages. It contains a specific module for each language in which data are stored. These modules are linked to each other through a mother dictionary where Spanish is the pivot language. This, allow, this allows the alignment of, of uh, the data of each language and enables their contrastive display according to the user's needs. In this way, Porlex can be defined not only as a multilingual dictionary, but above all, also as a cross-lingual dictionary. Uh, in, order to, in order to get a broad data set, Porlex relied on corpora uh, for the different languages described. The examination of the compiled corpus data soon revealed that many extracted examples or uh, surface realizations did not meet the requirements of a valency dictionary, and in this sense, we have encountered difficulties related to the following issues. Um, the time-consuming corpus-based compilation of all surface realizations. In this case, the search for certain realizations functioning as noun complements, such as adjectives or uh, compounds, in the case of German, is very time-demanding, since they are either scarcely represented in large corpora or are not found in them, even though they do exist in the language. The laborious uh, description of the noun argument patterns. This description involves the compilation of all possible combinations and syntactic semantics restrictions for each argument, along with the different surface realizations in the five target languages. For example, in this current state, the dictionary describes 61 patterns for the German noun Flucht. 16 are monoargumental, 31 biargumental, 13 triargumental, and one is tetraargumental. Corpus extracted data do not often suit the requirements of a valency dictionary. This is mainly due to the fact that most of corpora are not semantically tagged or tagged. These cases in which two or more noun arguments present the same form of realization are quite frequent. Thus, very often, observing the semantic features of a corpus realization is the only way to determine or determine to which semantic argument it belongs. It means that a human review of the query results is necessary to find examples needed to represent a specific semantic role. 
For this reason, it's not enough to pick up the lexical units retrieved by queries in large corpora. The project aims to solve this problem, or tries to, <laughs> by first identifying the semantic prototypes involved in the roles of the arguments. Ultimately, the purpose is thus the creation of semantically coherent paradigms for the generation of non-structures according to the information compiled in Porlex. So, I will talk now about uh, the methodology and the tools we have developed. So, the automatic generation of noun phrases with their arguments relies specifically on a combined method, which is based on the following methodological phases. Uh, the argument pattern queries on, on corpora, the lexical prototyping, prototype expansion, expansion deb debugging, um, prod paradigmatic packaging, and the, the noun phrase generation, of course. We will focus here on the lexical prototyping phase as well as on the procedure, the procedure for expanding prototypes and for generating noun phrases. The Podlex dictionary is used to obtain syntactic and semantic pa patterns on noun arguments in Spanish, German, and French. Argument patterns in Podlex provide the parameters for queries in, in, in corpora. We, we use Sketch Engine to tell you the truth. <laughs> These queries are designed to identify lexical units that could fill in the argument slots of the noun selected. A detailed semantic examination of the examples obtained from CQL queries is carried out following a frequency criterion. Lexical units that appear frequently filling a nominal argument slot in Sketch Engine corpus are identified as prototypical slot candidates. As I've mentioned before, many con concordances obtained in search queries are not relevant or are repeated, so a human-made cleansing of data is necessary, unfortunately. The identification of lexical prototypes for each noun argument make it possible to define the main semantic classes involved in the slot, in the slot filling. This procedure enables to propose main semantic classes from these lexical prototypes. Uh, by prototyping, we get to establish not only the most representative semantic classes of the different argument patterns, but also the constraints involved in the lexical selection of the concerned pattern. On this slide, you can see an overview of the lexical semantic prototyping from the lexic for the, lex the German structure, and sorry about my pronunciation, uh, die Flucht aus, plus noun. Uh, starting from the selection of lexical, lexic, uh, lexical prototypes among the results of a SQL query on a sketch engine to the semantic classification of the slot filling prototypes. A, detail, a detailed description uh, of this process with this example is given on our contribution uh, to, to the proceedings of this conference. Once the semantic classification has been comp uh, completed, we can finally expand the semantic prototypes, that is, increase the largest possible number of lemmas in each one of them. To do this, we, we use uh, GALNET, the, uh, the Galician WordNet developed at, at my university, uh, the University of Vigo, the semi-automatic extraction of lexical candidates uh, for the paradigmatic axis of each argument relies on the fact that the synsets of WordNets following the Euro WordNet Euro WordNet model are associated with semantic or cognitive features. These features are categorized in different ontologies. In particular, we are dealing with the ontologies you, you, you can see on the slide, the suggested upper merge ontology, top concept ontology, WordNet domains, basic label concept, and epinonyms. Nevertheless, the difficulty in establishing these connections arises from the fact that the cognitive organization of the ontological classifications in WordNet uh, of Galnet do not follow exactly a fully adequate organization for the linguistic description required for multigenera. And only the Spanish language had an, uh, a WordNet linked to the aforementioned ontologies as part of the multilingual central uh, repository of, of WordNets. Thus, the first step undertaken was the creation of databases for French, um, uh, taking the WordNet Libre du Français as a basis, and for the German language, taking the extended open multilingual WordNet as a starting point. Both have been uh, made available on the uh, GalNet interface after being converted to the Euro WordNet, 
EU WordNet format of the MCR, the Multilingual Central Repository. Um, expansions of the semantic prototypes described earlier can thus be made by connecting them with the categories of ontologies linked to WordNet. These connections between semantic classes and WordNet ontological categories can be made using different custom-made design tools. I will talk about our APIs, Lematiza, Combina, and uh, Flexiona. First, we explore how the lemmas of each semantic prototype are classified into the, the ontologies in WordNet. Fortunately, we are doing it quickly thanks to Lematiza, which provides for each lemma the corresponding synset and their ontological information. Since we can see the ontological categories related to our semantic classes, we can design API queries to extract more WordNet synsets. We combine or cross-reference API queries using Combina to the Combina tool to obtain synsets and its variants in the three languages concerned. The results in JSON format of the most performing query, queries are cleaned by eliminating repetitions as well as a large number of synsets not relevant to our project, such as the scientific names of living beings, for example. Finally, the semantic, uh, semantic packages are developed by incorporating morphological information into the synsets and semantic labels into the files. Another tool, Flexiona, uses the free links dictionaries to add this morphological information to the selected synsets. As we, have, as we have seen, different custom-made tools were designed for our projects. I will describe here four of our tools. The APIs, the Matiza, Combina, and Shera. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Since uh, query APIs for each language were designed with the aim of extracting lexical data from queries, uh, pointing to the semantic relations of WordNet and to the ontologies linked to the syntax uh, in the EuroWord models. These APIs were made for, for making these queries. They provide the results in JSON, standard, in, a, in JSON, a standard data exchange format. Lematiza aims to ease more appropriate queries in the APIs. This tool allows introducing both concordances and frequency lists retrieved from CQL queries in Sketch Engine during the lexical prototyping process. Lematiza returns lemmas uh, from these CQL, CQL queries. Each resulting lemma is searched in turn in the uh, WordNet of the corresponding language, and the output shows each of the synsets in which it's present. In addition, this tool provides links to API queries pointing to the ontological categories of each synthet, as well as to internal queries to its direct hyperneme and hyponemes and all its hyponemic descendants. Since Lematiza offer links to all synsets of Alema, a human disambiguation is needed to identify the meaning according to that specific use, usage in the corpus. Combina is... I'm going to rest, is the, is the, the tool that, that allows us to uh, combine uh, queries. Uh, sorry, I have to rest. And uh, Shera, which is the final tool, of course, the, the, the generator proto, proto, uh, prototype. This tool generates noun phrases using, using packages, lexical files built from the results of Combina searches. In query mode, it currently uses direct queries to an API or results from Combina in JSON format as input for lexical selections. The entire process is performed in real time. Specific inflectors have been developed for each language, which, which provide the appropriate form for each context. The, the code that produces the inflected forms reuses dictionaries of the well-known tagger FreeLing. The presence of each lemma is verified and inflected forms are obtained by checking the morphosyntactic tags from the corresponding dictionary. When the elements are inflected, the concordances and possible restrictions on the usage of all words in the phrase are defined. The specific contractions of, it, of each language are carried out by means of functions that were specifically developed for this purpose. I had some words for the conclusions, but I don't want to waste my time. <laughs> so thank you very much, and thank you for your patience. Hello, I was wondering if you have a specific inventory of semantic rules or 
which there's about two million inventories depending on yeah. your approach. <laughs> so you just mentioned actant one and actant two, which is like agent and patient. Yeah, more or less. What yeah. are the others? Hmm. Uh, we are using the, the inventory of uh, semantic roles used by the, the coordinator of the, pro, of, the, of the project, Maria Jose Dominguez. Uh, she, well, before this project, she uh, was working on, on, on the comparison of the noun phrase between, of, of the German noun phrase and the Spanish noun phrase. And for her thesis and her works, he, she uses a, a list of semantic roles. We, we, we take this list as, as a reference, but of course there's lots of other... I, I'm just curious how many, because the grain size is important. You either make them up as you come along, or you say, we're going to get up to here and we stop. So I was just wondering, what, how many approximately? How, how many? I, now I don't remember, but, if, <laughs> but at least they are more or less 10 at least. And how do you sign them? Is this manually? How I, sorry. How are the semantic roles assigned to the assigned. arguments? Yeah, they, they are in, the, uh, it's done in the Porlex dictionary, of course, not, not for this project. And they are assigned following the criteria uh, exposed by Maria Jose Dominguez in, in her works. I cannot give you all the details, but, uh, but these criteria are published in, in her work, and of course you can send us an email, uh, and we can give you, of course, the text for you to Okay, thank to you very much. Sorry. I wanted to know, I was curious, um, what is the size of the, t it, it's impressive, you, you have a, a large list of tools, you propose a lot of work, yeah. I'm just curious about the size of the team uh, behind all this, the time frame you've been working on yeah. this, and uh, the size of the data set you currently have. Yeah, very good question. <laughs> Um, we were very naive at the beginning of the project. Uh, the, um, the, the team is a, a very reduced uh, team. There's more people for German. I mean, uh, I don't remember. But for French, because it's my part of, uh, of the project, we are only three people. Uh, uh, and, the, and the amount of work is, is uh, enormous. So, of course, and, and the time is just, for the first phase, just two years. So we only work on 10, on 10 nouns, uh, of course, <laughs> we have limited it to 10 nouns. And, and in the case of combina in the combinatory phase, we limited the, the, the work to some combinations, just some combinations. So, yeah, we had to, to of course, to limit the extent of the work, of course, yeah. It's a pity, but... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> I wanted to say. Bye.
I, uh, it's a long, has been a long day, so I hope I can be brief and quick. And, um, but uh, the title says a lot, uh, but I will try and focus a little bit on some aspects of what we've been doing. Um, I just wanted to start with telling you all that uh, we are the du I'm from the Dutch Language Institute and um, we have quite a bit on our plate. Uh, we, do, we have to describe historical and modern Dutch in corporate dictionaries, computational lexica. Uh, we do terminology, grammar, spelling, dialectology. We are a clarence center. Uh, our focus is researchers, but also language learners and general public. And I put some of these uh, uh, aspects in light blue because we were used to be the Institute for Dutch Lexicology and we, a couple of years ago, we turned into the Dutch Language Institute and it basically means with the same amount of people, more work. Uh, but you know all that about that in your own organization. So I want to just... Uh, give you a little bit of an insight of the people behind the, our institution. So we have nine linguists, but not nine full-time equivalent linguists. We have a, a computation linguists, software engineers, system administration, two people, and linguist assistants, and of course there's a communications officer, administration, and not to forget our director, who's also a very a distinguished linguist, uh, Frida Sturz. So a small organization, always have been. I'll take you back, if you have a so small team and these tasks, I'll take you back to 2005, to a situation I probably think is similar to a lot of organizations. And you will get some insight in how I discuss things with my team, because as long as the computer is not faster than uh, my drawing, I make drawings myself. So... Um, this was the situation as far as corpus building was concerned at, at uh, our organization in 2005. There, were da there was data coming in from uh, in our FTP server, newspaper material. That we had a corpus of a 5 million word corpus, a 27 million and 38 million word corpus with a Telnet user interface. We already had a corpus of 50 million words, which was an internal corpus. Uh, we were in a, in a European project, so we built up the Parolo corpus, and in 2005 we built the user interface for that. There was another department which uh, does the Dictionary of Present-day Dutch, which compiled their own corpus of present-day Dutch. Then we had a department which had built um, a historical corpus, and we were also busy with a prototype diachronic corpus for which we had designed also a basic TI encoding scheme for extracting, uh, for, uh, for, for, the, for the corpus building. So that was our situation. Different corpora, different departments, different user interfaces. That was our corpus situation. Now the dictionary situation, the computational linguistics, computational lexica was something similar. You had four historical dictionaries, two of them on CD-ROM. One of them, the Dictionary of Dutch Language, was a project by another, was a separate project. Uh, there was still a dictionary of Old Dutch being built with an XML editor in Altova. There was a dictionary of present-day Dutch in the other department who used XML in, uh, in, in, a, in, a own, in our own editor. And as for computation lexica, there's recently a spelling database finished for the spelling, official spelling of 2005. Uh, there was lemma part of speech and limited paradigm. And we had in, 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 another, in another group, we had a, a more complete computational lexicon with full paradigm uh, and also a parole lexicon uh, part, as part of the European project. So... Corporate dictionaries, computational lexica to describe the, uh, uh, the Dutch language. So we thought we needed to do something about this uh, situation. So, uh, and um, we thought if you talk about efficient and systematic and you do description of Dutch language, there's some requirements. You need to have a clear view on what is described. What do you have which is already there? We have to have a good corpus, good material there. 
Software is also important if you have a limited team. You just want to standardize on some software, some platforms, which is good for the knowledge uh, sharing and is good for maintenance. Application developments uh, could use some streamlining because there's only so many people and efforts you can put in applications. And we thought uh, we wanted to look at some uh, traditional workflows and see where we can do things more efficient. And the most important thing about that is was uh, to think beyond project boundaries uh, as an organization uh, and, uh, and look at your stuff uh, beyond the little groups working on it. So we started with the dictionaries. I will be brief on some of the information for uh, some, of things, some of these things we've already exp uh, explained in other projects. So one of the things we streamlined is we put our historical dictionaries in the same format in a, in a nice uh, uh, historical dictionary portal. So uh, that, uh, that was one of the actions. So dictionary of present day Dutch has uh, another, another structure. So we, we ha has its own dictionary application, but uh, for the user, if they want, they want to search both dictionaries at the same time, on our website, we have a, a simple portal. If you key in a word you want to find in our dictionaries, you'll find the results from all uh, dictionaries, both historical and modern. So we did something about uh, the dictionary. Uh, for our computational lexica, we thought, well, a computational lexicon we use for enrichment. You, use, you, you, have that, you can structure information there. We thought uh, we want, uh, at, at, in the end, have a central database in which, uh, and that's my uh, moonshot view, in which each Dutch word in the Dutch language has its own uh, Registration number, like you have on uh, uh, for your in your in our country, you have a, 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 a service number which are you are identified with. So a central database in which we store the structured information and linking that to our other products. So since our historical dictionaries were well structured, we could start building on. Uh, the historical component of that computation lexicon, and this is in a modular approach. And when in 2015 we needed to do renew the spelling database, we thought, oh, never again in a separate project. We'll do it in the same structure, we'll do a, a, se a separate module, and we'll be gradually clicking these, uh, this information together in the central database. And why can we do that? Because even though it's historical Dutch, Every historical word has a modern Dutch equivalent in all our content and in all our material. So that was the computational lexicon part we tackled. And as far as our corpora, uh, which I thought our corpora mess was concerned, it was not a mess, it was we were quick at building corpora, but then we lagged behind because of being small and doing other things. We uh, decided to go for a central corpus with one metadata scheme, one TEI encoding scheme for all corpora. We, did this, uh, we developed a back-end for all corpora, modern and historical, and a corpus front-end, which is, will, is currently being renewed also for all corpora. So with one user interface, one back-end, uh, uh, um, have these corpora there. And we can, for present-day Dutch, uh, distinguish between internal and external corpora. There's corpus material we put online based on the metadata, and there's an internal corpus we use for when, when a material is not rights free. But then there's still this workflow. So, uh, <laughs> not to my drawings. So, you have a corpus and you have different projects. On the right hand side, do a couple of things. Uh, I drew a couple of things. There's Neolog. There's, the, there's this project which uh, searches for neologisms. There's the Dictionary of Present Day Dutch, the ANW. They do things in overlap together in the same editor. And some some neologisms are only published in the neologi neologism website. In the other ones online, there's uh, the dictionary uh, 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 for spelling we put online as well. So we think we think the stream should be. You have corpus material. There's project selecting the material that goes into the central database. We, we check, 
Has there been things described already in the central database? Do we have information on paradigm already there? If not, you can add it. Uh, and if, uh, if it's there, you just link, uh, you link your uh, descriptive material and then you have it in your separate database projects. That's the ideal picture. But to, uh, to do that, there are several steps in this process in which you can optimize. And we started looking at every component and see, uh, and I will give you some examples of how we try to optimize the process. So one of the first thing is uh, the corpora and corpus building, and which I'm really pleased of is our, our corpus um, uh, is managed in a relate, relational database. And there's a workflow system uh, uh, and there's a schedule. We use Jenkins to schedule the automatic, automatic uh, process. And there's continuous integration. Our favorite way of corpus building is you come, uh, you get uh, corpus material from the FTP server. There's uh, all kinds of works are done and you end up with automatic indexing and automatic updating of your corpus material. So uh, what, we, what we do, uh, we resolve, we have everything in a relational database because you all know if you have millions of millions of files and you want to back up, there's always an issue with backups. So that's why it's stored in a relational database. Uh, each, uh, we, we retain different states. We retain the source. We have a state with, where we add a persistent identifier to the file and convert to UTF-8 if it's necessary. There's a stage with a TI. There's a stage where uh, there's a, a state where it's part of speech tag and lemmatized. And we have recently been adding a, a stage where the material is passed. Okay. These states are the results of different actions. So you update your data of either the FTP server or manually if it's not uh, part of a monitor corpus which you get via FTP server. You do conversion, uh, uh, deduplication because we have newspapers and several editions have the same article, post tag and amortization, passing and indexing. The passing bit is uh, still to be implemented as an automatic process, uh, but automatic indexing is already in there. And this is put in rules in, uh, in the database, and uh, we can monitor that with Jenkins. So J Jen Jenkins knows uh, each stage uh, which we have to do, and the error handling is also done uh, via Jenkins. So if there's a conf an automatic conversion, there's an error, we get emails saying, oh, look, uh, we don't get data anymore from the FTP server, or hmm, something is wrong, there's too many errors in the conversion, there might be something wrong there. And sometimes it is because they change the data format without us knowing, or there's some other hiccups there, it's, uh, it is managed like that. We can look uh, at the material in the database and you can see here that uh, all stages are related. So you have the original and the TI and through the persistent identifier we can uh, look through everything there and it's useful because when conversion goes wrong you want to have a quick access to some examples. Okay, that's uh, our corpus uh, building work, uh, system uh, which we have right now. Um, the second part we looked at was uh, is the central database. If you do for, mo for modern Dutch, then I'll talk about modern Dutch only. You want to build a computational lexicon, and it's a central database. There are some things uh, you would like to have uh, that are more efficient. So suppose you have uh, something like body scan. This is uh, out of a new corpus application where you can find it, and you see it is being used more and more in our corpus. Uh, there, you, uh, if in the dictionary of present day Dutch, you want to have the paradigm in there. This is how it's currently in the editor, but that was usually done by the, uh, di by the, by the editors of the project itself. And we want to replace that uh, with uh, the information in our central database because then there's only one team that does the complete paradigm for all the products at INT. Um, we use that same information for uh, the online spelling uh, database, which people use in the Netherlands, so this is the same information. So to optimize that, that's a lot of work you have to do, and we have to be 100% correct. Because it, the computation lexicon 
is used also as a spelling database. So if you have like a verb like aanmoedigen, you have 30 paradigm positions. You don't want to, people to have to key everything in and, uh, uh, and with, uh, with, every, with the segmentation and everything there. Uh, so uh, this is uh, an example of the central database and what we have is a system of automatic paradigm generation based on an example. So if you have aanmoedigen, you have the paradigm of aanmoedigen in your database and you have now uh, a new uh, verb opmoedigen which also exists. You can look in the database for a verb that has the same paradigm and then he will automatically generate uh, the paradigm and then there's a manual correction. So since this database is used for spelling, it, there's manual correction going on by editors but you, you, uh, by, and by a team, but uh, what we also do, which is very important, is some automatic checks uh, on uh, 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 basic structure validity, consistency of hyphenation, and check on inflections just to correct errors which uh, people who are really critical and very never see. So that is the part we do for the lexicon building there for the modern lexicon. And then uh, what we uh, really want is to now uh, combine everything together that is when there's, uh, 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 in the, when there's a, a product, a project uh, describing some type of vocabulary getting it from the corpus, that there's the link with the central database and that they can get to description and get it out uh, there uh, in their own project. And I'll give you an example for Neolog, which is uh, uh, for neologisms. Um, we already had a system where we check, uh, automatically check uh, every month whether there's word forms in our corpus which weren't there before. It's a very simple way of trying to uh, see whether there are potential neologisms appearing in the project. We have, uh, we have uh, a working environment which, uh, which uh, the editor has and what basically when uh, uh, the editor selects one of, uh, one of the potential neologisms and it's not in the central database, we have an API on the Molex lexicon, so he can uh, say, oh, I want this in my dictionary, then he can uh, select the part of speech uh, he or she needs and he'll get automatic uh, and, uh, and, uh, and automatically an ID, uh, an ID persist, uh, the the word he has selected will be in a central database and I can show you over there. So here, oh, sorry. here, it will, here it will show you that this was an entry that was uh, uh, entered by one of the people from the Neologism project, sorry about that. And then uh, the, this tip, uh, the team responsible for the modern lexicon will make sure that everything, uh, all the information needed is in there, that the spelling is correct and everything there, and that the part of speech and lemma and everything is in order. And of course, if there's uh, a case of, uh, of, uh, of uh, potential homonyms, uh, they can have a look at the paradigm in there and select or add a new homonym that system uh, is there. Now, um, um, what are the challenges? The challenges is that it would have been nice to, be th to have thought of that before. That means that you have existing projects uh, that are already there and you want to systemize and make sure that they continue in the same way, more efficient. So the challenge is uh, the linking of the existing data to the central database. And something simple like what is a lemma can differ in uh, different projects. So that's a lot of data work. Synchronization. You know, editors, if they take, so if a, a lexicographer, it's, if, it, if he or she takes information from another project, they want to make sure that it's correct. And if, but if this project changes something, you, they want to see the changes as well in, in the dictionary. So there's, you have to have a good uh, system to synchronize everything there. There's uh, editing environments um, you have to adapt. So uh, there's a lot of work involved uh, in this. Um, is this smart lexicography, I was thinking? 
We are really very down to earth. We, uh, that's why I asked in the previous lecture how many people are working there, how many data have you done. We have to produce high quality data. That means we try to do automatic processing as much as possible, but there's always manual verification in there. So we're looking very much into uh, what is efficient as an automatic procedure. Does it involve a lot of manual verification afterwards? We also look into a lot of uh, um, good systems for efficient manual correction. Um, synergy is also important. Uh, synergy, for instance, if you, if you saw uh, very, uh, very quickly, there's, we have a rapid application development platform which we use for several, several projects because in two days we can have new functions there which, uh, which, uh, which can work. That, uh, so uh, um, we share information and editors. That's the synergy we're looking for because we have a limited amount of people and we want to do a lot of things there. And we believe that good data management is also essential. I, can, I don't know whether uh, there are corpus builders in the, in the room. Uh, what we now have is so nice if we have a new tagger or an improved tagger. We don't have to think about, oh, where was the stuff again? Uh, where you can really... Take, uh, uh, leave the first two phases, add a new tagger in your workflow, retag the complete system, and everything is in place. And so you are way more flexible. There's a place where you can find all your information. It's always there. So that good data management for the corpus, but also for what you've been describing, is uh, for, us, for us essential, and it eventually saves time. Is that uh, enough? Of course, that's not enough. Um, uh, in uh, November, we'll have a large uh, a workshop, uh, limited, but it will come, there'll be a white paper on the future of academic lexicography in which we want to explore what we can do more with artificial intelligence and more uh, uh, sophisticated methods uh, to do a proper uh, description of a modern Dutch. So... Uh, but we also, after, after being almost there with what we consider to be the basics, we're looking forward to, uh, to the future there. And that was my talk. We are coding the Indo-European sound laws. So have you tried that, for instance, that you could uh, uh, derive uh, modern uh, Dutch words from old low Frankish or old Dutch, as it is uh, called? No, not, not, uh, we have done work on etymological dictionaries, but not in that sense like you relate to, no. I've, I've yes. from a colleague who went to your talk, so I'll catch up with the work you've been doing. No, yes, I will show it uh, later on because yes. uh, that could also solve some of your problems. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is about the, the lexicon or the, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the database. Yes. So, um, Gigant, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, I think that what we are moving into, you know, the world where um, all languages like Dutch or Slovenian will be actually described in such databases. Yeah. So, we have a data model there. Yeah. Uh, how, uh, how universal do you think your model is? So how much of it could be transferred to other languages in the sense that you could recommend your model. So this is how we organize our data about modern Dutch. And you could do fairly similar thing for Croatian, let's say. Yeah, there's, there's features in other languages that we don't have for Dutch. Very simple. But... I don't see why you could, could not have something similar. Uh, it's, a, it's really 
a, a very straightforward relational database in which we uh, put uh, the information. We keep on, we have, uh, I, don't, I don't see why it couldn't be expanded to other languages. When I saw the Europe, Portuguese uh, uh, lecture on the Portuguese this morning on the spelling uh, lexicon. I thought well, there's similarities. I, I want there, there's there's uh, there's a lot you can do there. But I would I would have to see. It's a it's a very straightforward, simple model. You have part of speech. You have lemma. You have a gloss. We have uh, additional information. Uh, we have a complete paradigm. I don't see why you couldn't do, couldn't do that for other languages. Alternative yeah. languages like uh, Finnish or Hungarian, it would be a strange approach to try to build a full paradigm and yeah. manually revise it. That would be impossible. So that's, yeah, that's, but that's always my hesitation because I always think of these two languages. Yeah, that's, that's true. Share with us which um, tag set you use for your part of speech and also for the metadata. Okay, the tag set we used is uh, is, uh, is a tag set, tag set we designed uh, to work for uh, the diachronic description of Dutch, so for modern and diachronic description of Dutch, and. Um, we called, that was the first, one of the first things we did for the development of the Gigant model is see uh, to see what uh, would fit for the synchronic and diachronic description of the language. Uh, I must say we have mappings to uh, all kinds of other tag sets there from universal dependencies to the tag set used in the, uh, the corpus of spoken Dutch. So uh, and, we, and I know for historical Dutch, uh, the tag set uh, uh, which is used in the Netherlands amongst people building historical corpora will be revised because the standard tag set which is usually used in, in, in the Netherlands for the corpus uh, of spoken Dutch is not applicable to historical Dutch. So in the next Clara, Claria project, We'll be revising the, this tax set there. But we have the mappings to uh, universal dependencies there as well. Uh. Any other questions? Uh, I'm glad you noticed the detection of neologism in your workflow. But uh, detecting new word firms is a relatively easy task. What about the new senses of words that already exist in the in the language? Oh, I know, I know. That's that's all. That's um, uh, that is, of course, uh, uh, some some of the, these things. I hope will improve. And we have methods to do that, and we try and keep up to date with all the developments which are done in universities. But we have a different, uh, and eventually we have a different way of evaluating this, these technologies. You have uh, the de technology developers who uh, evaluate their algorithms and say, uh, what, uh, how well they work and how well they work in comparison to other algorithms. For me, uh, what, how we look at it is not is how much work will we still need to do to really get to this end product we envisage. And that's a different form of evaluation. And I would uh, love to have more time to, to have measure, measurements for that. I can remember discussion with uh, a computational linguist. Uh, we want to have a morphological module, a, morph a morphological module to parse uh, uh, or entries and put it also in the in the Gigant database. And uh, he wrote a, 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 an exact, a nice paper on how well it worked and how well first level and the second level went. And I said, but do you have an evaluation on how much uh, correction is still needed uh, to come from, uh, to have a correctly parsed entry there? Oh, no, no, that was, no, no, he, 
And that would be the way we look at uh, how tools work. And I think there's a lot of work still to be done in this type of evaluation if we as lexicographers want to use this modern technology. But, uh, yeah. Okay. I think that's a good closing point.